little fun. I'd like you to get to uh, page 192, 193. <clears throat> he talks about all of the great works of Porphyry and says, Unfortunately, we don't have any. They've all been destroyed. And he has some great titles concerning philosophy from the oracles, Plotinus, commentary on the Timaeus of Plato, divine names. <clears throat> Look at five, though. Concerning the allegories of the Grecian and Egyptian theology. How much Porphyry excelled in works of this kind is sufficiently evident from his explanation of the cave of the nymphs in Homer, which is fortunately preserved, and the translation of which in the following pages will both adorn the present history and I doubt not be acceptable to the reader. So. He talks about all kinds of theories that they think Porphyry had, but what has survived is uh, the, the cave of the nymphs in Homer. All right. Notice then. On the regress of the soul, which is sixth category, he talks about a great work which is gone. The design of this excellent work, St. Augustine picked up and used, often cites it in the City of God. And it has one basic issue, right? And that is a discourse concerning the purgation of the soul by the theurgic art, theurgy, at which we cannot wonder this, this reverend father should both ridicule and disclaim, for because after all, how can the faith of a bishop agree with the dogma of a philosopher, which is a nice rhetorical question. But what is this theurgic art? But it is here necessary to inform the reader that the theurgical art, explained and recommended by Porphyry in his treatise, consists in purifying the imaginative spirit or vehicle of the soul. Okay. Hey, flip to the next page. About three lines down from the top, he now quotes. I cannot refrain from presenting the English reader with a translation of his doctrine concerning the fantastic spirit, or as he calls it, spiritual soul. Quote, in what the disease says of this spirit consists by what means it languishes and is dulled and how it becomes purified and defecated and restored to its natural simplicity and perfection must be learned from the arcana <clears throat> of philosophy, from which being purified by the lustrations of mysteries, it passes in divine condition of being. That nice way of talking, but he doesn't get to the point until on page 195, where he talks about this fantastic spirit is situated in the confines of the rational and brutal nature in corporeal, corporeal degree. It's a common lab, a common boundary of both. So from this point on, what he means by fantastic, of course, is daydreams. Imagination. Right where we imagine
the whole theurgic art is nothing other than dealing with this problem. I have two parts to it. It's not a problem in itself. It depends upon how it is being structured. Right? So we'll use daydreams. It's easier than keep saying fantastic. Um, he has three divisions. I want you to just quickly go over the three divisions, and then we can have some fun. And therefore, ways of getting out and purifying. Um, now, he is... Uh, He's got this issue, okay? He's got, he has the extremes. And the mean or the middle of the use of daydreams or fantastic images. And so he's going to talk about what happens, see the furthest is corporeal or dealing with images of the body, body corporeal. On the other side, non-bodily incorporeal. Two extremes, okay, like, uh, we can easily do it. Um, why don't you just take a minute out and just imagine yourself totally enlightened? Go ahead. Well, I'll wait for a few minutes. Don't spend too long there. <laughs> totally. See? Okay. Go the other extreme, right? Happily in the body, sensual, right? Those are the two extremes he's talking about. And therefore, what he's saying is, Imagination, so this is the imaginative function, this is the imagination. The theurgic art is nothing other than understanding how daydreams function on three levels and how to, by understanding it, move up. That's the theurgic art. For this fantastic spirit is situated in the confines of the rational and brutal nature. It is of an incorporeal and corporeal degree. And it's a common boundary of both. It's a medium which conjoins divine natures with the lowest of all. On this account, on this account it is difficult difficult to comprehend the, its nature by philosophy, for it collects that which accords with itself as if it were from neighboring natures and from the extremes of each and comprehends in one essence things separated by so great an interval from its own, which is a fancy way of saying, right? To the degree that you moved in this direction, this is the direction akin to philosophy. Right? To the degree that you move in this direction, you're now removing yourself from this realm and all the consequences that follow from it, and equally well when you identify with this and get into that, equally things happen that obscure and block participation in this. This whole thing rests upon, therefore, just one great principle we're familiar with, right? Um, the mind 
seeks to know the mind? And benefits? Knowing how it functions. Well, that's basically the principle. And therefore, since imagination is one of the functions of the soul or the mind, hey, get to know to know the mind, get to know how it, ben it benefits by knowing how it functions. If we can see how this functions, then we can benefit by knowing it. And therefore, he's going to now function on these three levels. Um, It's got a very uh, fine way of presenting a whole set of ideas akin to this. Um, but he doesn't get into the practice of how to do this for several pages. So I thought we would just go there and take a look at the practice. And therefore, page 201. Now, before we do it, I want to do one more thing, okay? He has two parts to this. <coughs> After this exploration, he's going into Homer, the Odyssey, the Cave of the Nymphs. Look her. The cave of the nose. Huh? Now, <coughs> he says, now remember, he's trying to bring back, restore philosophy by getting back into Porphyry. Porphyry has a whole exploration, a whole exploration of the cave. And uh, the cave is in the 11th or the 13th? I think it's the 11th. Uh, I should know. I, uh, 13th book of the Odyssey. I, I know, 13th book. Now, why is this important? Because he's going to say that this, this, uh, this is really an allegory. Right? The cave is an allegory. As an allegory, he's going to state it and treat it analogically. What's he going to do? As an allegory, can be expanded, understood by finding terms that are equivalent to each, right? Our usual way. Right. 
So the terms of the myth, he then has to seek for what they represent. And when that's done, of course, he has what he would call the meaning of the allegory, if he can then apply it to the context of the work. Now, this guy is very interesting. Um, by the way, um, what was this stuff over here we called it? Do you remember what we called it? What kind of faculty is it? Daydreams. <coughs> Imagination? Yep. That's, that's the imagination. So he's showing, therefore, taking one of the great examples from Homer, Porphyry is saying, this is the way to use the mind imaginatively working on an allegory, which is a systematic use of the exploration of major ideas and how they function in terms of classic images, right? So what do you think I'm going to suggest for next time? Duff. Book 13 of the Odyssey. Hey, that's a great idea. Who said that? <laughs> <laughs> and look, you know what? We're going to find rather curious the, the way in which he discovers these terms. Where because look, this work is 800 B.C., There is no surviving literature from 800 B.C. until we bump into Parmenides or Thales, which is 400 or 450, right? It's gone. Just like after Aristotle, there's a big gap until we run into Plotinus, 270, right? Now look here. In other words, he... We have, we do not have any material to draw upon current with his age, Homer's age, or the tradition he came from. There isn't any such material available. There isn't any material for us from this period. Therefore, what Porphyry is going to do, he's going to say, let us take this body of Platonic literature and see if we can find some key terms that these thinkers are using and draw upon that to add substance to the terms of the allegory. Is that what he's doing? Mm -hmm. He's interpreting the symbols and the allegory by finding philosophical mm -hmm. parallels where these people are using the same language and images, and he's working on the assumption, therefore, that while we're, we don't understand what went on, they did, and therefore, they're continuing that kind of language and tradition. Assumption, of course, right? That is to say, he is not <coughs> making an internal analysis for understanding the myth. He's using this approach. So his assumption is that this is so rich that it molded the thought of people the subsequent to them and influenced all these major philosophers, and they continued using this set of major ideas in a variety of ways, and he collects them together and says, hey, look, they're all using them in the same way. Since he finds a common, take like the word cave itself, all right? Let's just say the word cave. This is why I'll tell you how the idea of cave expresses itself, and then he pulls it out from all the linear Platonic thinkers that he knows. And therefore, he builds a common theme, and that he can pick that up, that set of meanings, and dump it into that term. Honey, 
Another one, right? Honey. Let C be honey. Bees and honey. Because they play a major role in the cave, allegory of the cave. Look, what does he do? He checks out where that idea comes from, how frequent it is, the Egyptian, Syrian, he goes all over the place. He finds, however, a commonness in it all, then that becomes the substance for that. That's what he pursues. What's he doing? The imag he's waking, at, waking up our imagination, filling it in with much, much, much substance, so then it enlivens the allegory, does it not? That's the imaginative use of the soul. So this part, he's going to be dealing just with the fantastic part in respect to individual experiences, in respect to the soul of man. Right? So they're, they're together, right? Now, uh, I had a talk with Barbara before, and she said it would be better for me to urge you guys just to memorize the first 13 books, then you don't have to carry the book with you by next week. <laughs> and I, I, I opposed it for a short while, but she had such overwhelming logic on her side that I said, okay. Is that the way our discussion was? I, I, I do believe that was the way it went, yes. <laughs> now, uh, I... Uh, I don't know whether this is uh, interesting to you, but some time ago I got into this, you know, the, the cave, and had a lot of fun with it. We did it. How many? How long ago did we do this one? I can't recall. Weren't you in on that too? How many years ago? I don't recall. I really don't recall. But a good I remember number. Remember that we did it. A good number. Right, we did it. So we're going back to it. Indeed. Now, why am I mentioning that? Well, uh, I decided that since it's only two pages, I just take out my copy of Homer and Xerox those pages and make sure you at least you know you have that with you. But when I got to <laughs> when I got to Home Depot, not yeah, no, no, what's the other one? Staples. I went in there and I put my book down and oh my God, it's all full of notes. And so they made copies anyhow, so uh, good. it has all my junk on it, so you can ignore it or use it. But um, so if you'd like a, a couple of copies of it. Yeah. Wait a minute, that's not it. <coughs> ah, Professor sorry. Grimes? Can you ask a question? Yeah, I was... Uh, love that's so kind of you. <laughs> it's all marked up. So, in any case, if you guys would like, like before you leave, grab it. And, uh, it now, all of this, since they're referenced to pages and all kinds of notes and uh, different works, uh, this is the. Um, This is the Fitzgerald. This is the Fitzgerald. The reason I'm pointing out this work is because a lot of these things have page references, and I thought I'd show you at least the volume that has such references. And you can, if you're interested, you can correlate it yourself. And it's cheap paperback. Up here. Yes. Uh, Porphyry here in this imaginative thing is he is he going to archetypes or? I mean, is he saying that everybody should arrive at these same conclusions because there's something archetypical about that, what we're seeking here? I couldn't say it better. So I can say yes. No, that's right. No, no relativity. No. Okay. So therefore, we're finished with that aspect. So.
Would you like a copy of it? Or? Yeah, wanted to take a moment out and pass them around? Okay. Sure. Yeah. There are two pages, and you'll notice one is different from the other, which is why they're called two pages. Two pages, one each, and I get to separate. Yeah. And when we go back, we'll go back into this division and his uh, method. Can we make sure our guests? No, 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 that's just guests. Yeah. How many copies are there? That's a question. I don't mean that. I mean, how many copies are there? We have more for you to read. Are there? I guess it's 242. Thank you. And welcome. Okay, when you get back, we'll be on page 201. That's where he breaks up these three in a nice arrangement, and we'll go into it. I have a question. We've got two pages. Got to make two sure. Pages of what? Sorry, we've got two. We're talking about the imagination as a, as a power. Yeah, I got like lines 303 and 363. And it can produce either bodily images, daydreams, or dramas. Okay. So it looks like you need 242, which is divine. this little sucker. Um, and you probably need. And then we went. There, you, that's two copies of the same. The allegory of the cave. That's right. Um, so you need so one more copy? Is he Porphyry's and we only need one of each. I'm going to photo the paradigmatic. We, we, we get oh, together okay, on okay, Saturdays. Okay, use of the well, okay, a, a product. Don't you want something to work with? Right? Right? Yeah. He doesn't yeah. say that. Yeah. That's really strong. It's a, now, this is a copy of 242, and then you have two copies of 240 and 242? Okay, thank you. Because if he's saying everyone who has a really uh, quality <laughs> who succeeds Homer in this tradition calls a piece of It's interesting to, it'll be interesting to, think, to see what he thinks about how Homer came up. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it was just a product of the imagination. One other topic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. See Marty. He, does, he doesn't do a research at this point. Because, remember, his purpose is history of. So therefore, he wants to give. This is giving a history mm -hmm. of how they use these ideas in the restoration of philosophy. Same thing. Yeah. Next question. Yeah. Does he see this then as a an exercise in theurgy? That's where we're going. Okay. Is it this? Yeah. I mean, does no. This, okay. Because I want to see. What but he leaves you with it. Okay. I, I, I'm interested in the connection then between the, the process or the exercise of theurgy and this product. That's right. That's right. That's right. I want to see how you got it. Okay. Yeah, you'll see whether or not we can do that when we get to this stage. Right. Yeah, that's one copy, that's one copy. How do we move away right? from one towards <coughs> the other? No, I should even make it. Yeah. If we can understand how he is addressing the issue of the imagination and the fantastic art as a theurgic discipline, he's going to try to show us the difference between these three stages. When we get here, we should be able to see whether or not, given that, it fits this. Right. And how we can use it. Yeah. Pierre, why does he use the word a theurgic? I always thought of theurgy as magical operations done with That's a group true. of people. That's true. So that he's going true. to show us some magical operations to... Because, no, yeah, that's true. Uh, that is only one way of understanding how the ancients used the word theurgy. Oh, it has other uses? Yeah. Mm. Like Proclus, uh, 153, in his propositions, he explores the urge uh, as uh, any number of objects have a certain aura about them. Mm. And therefore, the assumption <coughs> is if you can line up objects that have a certain propensity or power and put them in a certain arrangement, and if that arrangement is similar to the properties of certain divinities, then you are setting up a similaricum between the two. Harmonium. Among, yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is the higher, this is the philosophical theology, which, does, which is saying the same thing, <clears throat> but it's saying if you understand what's going on, that is theurgic, that's magic. 
and we'll see that in this paragraph. So that's why I have to get someone to read it, because you know I've already worked very hard, and I shouldn't work too much. So yeah. here, the, the other the other definition you uh -oh. gave is uh, so then arranging these objects that have a certain power, then they're evoking uh, <clears throat> deities or yeah. gods or yeah. Yeah. demons. Like the same thing when people collect objects, go to auctions, and they purchase this object or that object from their beloved movie star, right, and put them around the house. They're trying to reestablish some kind of atmosphere that reminds them of their yeah. devoted home movie star. Right. Just push it up another level. There are uh, also people who believe or maintain that uh, there's a philosophical theurgy that doesn't use objects, but uses the logos. That's what this is. Yeah, theurgy through the logos. Focus. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's logos, central. Okay, we push? Yeah. Daniel, who should we get to read? Arthur, who I should we get to read? Daniel, he's a good reader. Yeah, but it's small print. He may be just whispering since. The <laughs> we have it over here on the bigger. And there's big there. Which one are we? Which? Show me what to read. I can follow you. He's a good reader. I can read. Uh, you just have to let me know what to read. Am I reading up here? Or am I reading out of Thomas Taylor? No, yeah, but we want to get to the third section on corporations. That's, we're reading that's that. What, what page we're here? Is that, uh, okay. Then it should be the paragraph on 201. Okay, 201. But it cannot be denied that the purported we've got essence it. of the fantastic. Got it? Got it. Oh, okay, to read it live for us, please. <coughs> and I'll blow a whistle every once in a while and so we can stop and go over it. Okay, jump in. But it cannot be denied that the corporeal essence of the fantastic spirit when arrived at this place, is at the same time elevated with the returning soul and adapted to the spheres, or in other words, it is brought back to its proper nature and pristine condition. These two regions, therefore, are situated in perfect opposition to each other, the one profoundly obscure, but the other every way lucid, obtaining the extremities of felicity and misery. But how many middle regions do you think are situated in the concave space of this mundane orb? partly lucid and partly dark, in all which the soul lives. With this fantastic spirit, it alternately changes its form and manners and life. When therefore it returns to its proper nobility, it becomes the storehouse of truth. For it is then pure and pellucid and perfectly immaculate, and has power, if willing, to become a god and a prophet. But when it falls from this elevation, it becomes dark erratic and fictitious, for the obscurity of the spirit cannot perceive the perspicuity of true beings. Lastly, when it possesses a middle situation, it partly wanders and partly pursues the truth. You may also, you may also by this means explore a demonical nature and its order, for to pursue truth entirely or to wander but a little from its contemplation is divine, or nearly divine. But a condition of being, erroneous and predictions necessarily belongs to such as are assiduously inclined to nature, who are obnoxious to passion and perfectly ambitious, for by this means such a condition becomes subterranean and forsakes divinity, and its more ancient daemon from by a contrary mode of proceeding to may resume its pristine associations and occupy the place prepared for a more excellent nature. See, the way he's writing, see, the way in which he's writing, he's going to explore this. Can we go to two, 203 and pick it up now when he's going to bring it from uh, uh, Synesius? Um, on the top of the page, through the th theological art is unfortunately lost by means of which we might obtain the best method of purifying the fantastic spirit. Yet, 
we must not suppose that it's entirely impossible to accomplish this desirable end without its assistance. Sinesius, and the preceding beautiful quotation informs us. Now, uh, within this more extended paragraph, you'll find one, two, three that we're looking for. All right? Can you pick it up from there, please? Yeah, thank you. Sinesius, and the preceding a beautiful, in, <clears throat> sorry, and the preceding beautiful quotation informs us that an intellectual perception attenuates the spirit in an occult and ineffable manner and extends to div divinity. Ex excuse me, extends to its divinity. Indeed, nothing can so effectually contribute to separate to separate the fantasy from the terrain body as a continual intellectual illumination. One. Go ahead. Now this can only be acquired by long habits of meditation accompanied with a vehement thirst for after truth, which gradually withdraw from the soul from sensible perturbations, produce the contemplative virtues, and dispel the darkness of corporeal imaginations. Two. See the difference? The first is continual intellectual illumination versus uh, those who have acquired by long habits of meditation, right? So keep going. Science, indeed, is the first requisite in acquiring this purification of the fantasy. I mean the mathematical science, by whose assistance we first recognize the glimmerings of truth and discover the dawning beams of intellect emerging, as it were, from the night of oblivion. When the liberal soul first discovers this light, though but feeble and transient, she rejoices at the happy event and is anxious to procure its continuance and increase. She now despises outward, corporeal form, and becomes deeply enamored with those purer forms in the fantasy, which she has found to be the receptacles of truth. Okay, now it goes. One, two, three, go ahead. And this is the first degree of purification. But after this, if by a fortunate event, from contemplating universals and imaginative figures, she should rise to speculate their subsistence in cog cogitation, and in the rational soul, she will then discover a much brighter light. Through even this will not be constant and serene, for it will be present only when she is deeply engaged in such middle contemplations. Right, that's the middle. Go ahead. Indeed, as cogitation is the medium between sense and intellect, so the light attending its energies as a middle substance between the obscurity of the former and the invariable splendors of the latter. This light, however, will so purify the fantastic spirit that all it that all its images will possess a considerable degree of pers perscuity and luster. There now remains only the third step. In order to produce the perfection of purity and to conjoin the fantasy with divinity, and this is no other than an intimate conversion of the soul to the energies of intellect. For by long and vigorous exercise of this kind, a constant and ineffable light will continually illuminate the fantasy so as to render all its images pure and pellucid, and perfectly abolish the obscurity of sensible impressions. We may add to, as a symbol of this exalted purgation, that a perpetual serenity, unceasing delight, and occasional rapture will be produced in the soul. The will, now entirely free, will be intimately converted to that which is best, the desires. <clears throat> the desires will breathe nothing but the ardor of intellectual energy, and the passions will no longer be at a variance with reason. In this delightful state, the vehicle of the fantastic spirit will become so attenuated and ethereal that all sensible harmony will waken the soul to an immediate recollection of the ideal harmony. All external figure will recall to her memory ideal form, and all lucid bodies will represent with advantage to her inward eye, the brighter light reflected in the mirror of imagination. Indeed, sensible light will be found to possess a remarkable sympathy with this pure light of the soul. For when this intellectual splendor is firmly introduced and illuminates every part of the fantasy, the smallest spark and the most glimmering ray of external light 
will call forth into energy that sacred light, which is now perfectly seated in the sanctuary of the soul. Such too will be the temperament of the soul in this case, that she will spontaneously utter musical sounds as indications of the harmony within, and as echoes of the perpetual felicity she enjoys, and such are the methods of acquiring, and such the tokens of possessing purity of imagination. Okay, look, would you not agree, okay? You see what's here. What does it take? You have to go back into the text and dig out, right? Specifically, the points he's making. Because he uses uh, interesting language of the, you know, he's coming out of this 18th century English. Right? But that's our task. You have to now pull together one, two, three, and it should be stages as the way to divine luminosity. Right? Now, uh, would you not agree that <clears throat> we have done some interesting work on daydreams? Right. Daydreams have a drama. Daydreams have a star, you. The drama spins itself out. He's saying, that's right. By the way, depending upon the objects, so you are changed. But he doesn't go into, <coughs> right, he does it in general, like the first stage is coming to universals, and that's the stage, the avenue where the doorway is uh, geometry, right, getting away from sense perception into the general. That's the first stage. But uh, that doesn't really describe in any real detail what is the in, inner problem with daydreams or the imaginations or the fantastic aspect of the soul when it's hooked on this everyday level. So would you not agree? Barbara, who can you call on for a volunteer to come up with a daydream? Uh, anyone here. Just anybody here would have them? Anyone here would have them. There Wait may a be an exception. Wait a minute. Let me check if you're right. Brad, is she right? Yeah. Are you one of those people? I am, including Mark. <laughs> see, look, see. This the, we can play with this, you see. Make, let's make up a bunch of different daydreams that fit each of these qualities. And in a way, we were doing that a moment ago when I said, hey, daydream, you're perfectly enlightened. Okay? Would you not agree you would then have to have an image of yourself perfectly enlightened? Mm -hmm. So have you ever had that um, image? No. Oh, well, you can easily make one, can't you? <laughs> If you did, we'd see something very important in this game that, that uh, needs to be said. What is the problem with this? What's the problem with daydream? There are five different kinds of daydreams, right? We've gone through this once several times before. The kind of daydream we're interested to show this would be what the, the kind we can call tangent daydreams. That's easy. If you're going to spend some time on the Odyssey and the example of the cave, right, as you go through it, you're going to be absorbed into it. And you know what? You may go off on a tangent. 
write that down, write the tangent down, that tangent is a daydream, and then we can study it together and you will see it's the same dynamics in every case. Is that your subconscious reacting to what you're seeing objectively? Yeah, yes, but I don't use that language. Sorry. So I, uh, uh, so I don't use psychological language. I don't find it useful. Could you say that without? Another word for subconscious? Yeah. Your spiritual self? Your ah, therapy. thank you. Good. Then I don't have to think of Freud or which, no, which Jung system. Here. Or Jung or, yeah, okay, okay, thank you. So could you repeat that then without it? I forgot what he said. Oh, um, so I, I used the word subconscious. So I, I said, is that your subconscious coming up to, to meet what you were thinking of objectively? And then you took exception to my use of subconscious, and I said spiritual self. Yeah, I self. see you mean collective unconscious. Yes. I see. Yeah, OK. I wanted to get away from Freud. For the soul. Yeah, OK, yeah. This is pulling up images from, if you want to call it unconscious. Uh, that's so if true. that's the true source of it, then we should all, the same thing should come up, we should have a similar experience. Th that's the assertion. That's right. And a similar result. That is... And that could be a proof to us of the one soul uh, residing in all of us. Yeah. Uh, would you find it curious that the claim we're going to make then is that when we explore, we will always find they are failures. Never victories. Like Thomas Edison, you keep going through the failures you know whatever what the daydream right, so you get closer and closer to what whatever is Whatever right. the daydream is going to be, it's going to end in one way or the other in a failure. Now that's an assertion, and therefore we need some, some uh, volunteers to see whether or not we can support it from evidence. But there's nothing logically necessary about this. Unless you ask one question, is it possible that the way in which you picture yourself, if we get enough detail of it, there'll be something that will be incontro incontrovertible, but it will also be irreconcilable with the goal, and that you'll never see until you do it. So it's like the act of reading something and have it take you into a state of wondering about something other than what you're reading. It's sort of a, uh, an ethereal wondering. Yeah, yeah. Well, that will be a tangent. Right, that will be the tangent daydream. And if we can get then, in every daydream, there has to be the individual mm -hmm. and the assertion we're making, which we've made before, of course. The degree to which you can describe the way you are in the first scene with as much care as you can will contain within itself as the drama is acted out, the very conditions for its failure. So we're looking for a state of being yeah. in that state? Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah. then, you see what we were doing before. Uh, he's saying, cultivate this. Use the imagination. Right? He doesn't deal with this, what we're doing. He takes it in general in order to get us here. His object is not to study the mind and or the way in which it functions. His goal is to try to bring about this kind of synthesis to show the restoration of philosophy by pulling out the best of all of these Neoplatonists to restore the highest vision of philosophy. It's not this. It's not the study of the mind. Except insofar as the vehicle for such realization. But he's not for this. He's not doing this. this that's what we're doing. Because later he also is going to be talking about dreams, you see, and we can contrast what he says about dreams and what we do.
that comes uh, later. So, going back into the text, what do you think? Yeah. Hold it. Yeah, go ahead. Arthur? What is it? No, I was, I was just contemplating mm -hmm. what you're saying. Okay, that's allowed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a great section here on music. Right? Agree? Get a little section on music? That as this proceeds, as you get into this, see, he has the psychology of the soul. That as you then approach this, I should put it this way. Right. Then he describes what kinds of experiences attend such growth and development. And he's got that great line about uh, light and music. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Indeed, I'm on 204, sensible light will be found to possess a remarkable sympathy with this pure, pure light of the soul. For when this intellectual splendor is firmly introduced and illuminates every part of the fantasy, the smallest spark and the most glimmering ray of eternal light, of external light will call forth into energy that sacred light which is now perfectly seated in the sanctuary of the soul. So too will be the temperament of the soul in this case that she will spontaneously utter musical sounds as indications of the harmony within and as echoes of the per perpetual felicity she enjoys. And such are the methods of inquiring and such the tokens of possessing purity of imagination, which he who obtains will understand, but which will appear incomprehensible and ridiculous to him who is not advancing in this acquisition. And this is the transition into the cave. And here it may not be improper to observe that the fantasy in this purified state affords indubitable tokens of the possession of truth and serves as an instruction by which we may discover false opinions from those which are true. For the images attending the perceptions of reality will always be lucid, and this in proportion to the certainty they contain. Hence, whenever the soul is full and as it were pregnant with true conceptions, certain bright phantasms as the progeny of her rational energies will drop into the mirror of imagination and appear like images clothed with light. For the fantasy we will now no longer be for the fantasy will no will now no longer be similar to the dark and irrigrid ir <coughs> pardon me, that nearly threw me. irrigorous cavern of Calypso which appears to be an emblem of imagination in an unpurified state, illumined by sense and by an artificial fire, but it will be total diaphanous and full of light, and will indeed in every respect resemble the place, the palace of Ithaca, when enlight enlightened by the golden lamp of Minerva. Right. And then he makes the transition into Porphyry's treating concerning the cave of the nymphs, nymphs in the 13th book of the Odyssey, right? So we got work to do, you got to do this, you got to do it, you got to do it yourself, you got to do it, line it up. It's page 204, right? Yeah, please. Yes. No, no, no. So we got nothing else to do but work. So we are to allow ourselves to go into a fantasy and, in state, and watch our state of mind 
as a witness to the three events. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good thing. See, there are different daydreams. You can mm -hmm. you can uh, you make you make make your own. See, mm -hmm. right? uh, so uh, <coughs> uh, it would be good to have some really great descriptions of the highest enlightenment states. You know, go over them. So well, that's me. Okay, now let your mind play with it as a daydream and see where it goes. But if you want to see the one we are talking about, the tangent daydreams will get you very clearly into both uh, very easily. And you'll see the way in which it proceeds. Right. We've done it. Have you found that to be the case? Uh, with tangent daydreams, yes. Yeah. Well, let me let me let me back on. I found tangent daydreams to constantly end in failure. Mm -hmm. um, but your point just now was whether I had daydreams. Well, yes, both of the high variety that I'm in some great mm -hmm. state of mind, mm -hmm. and right, as well as um, the opposite, more obscure. Right. Yeah. Well, we, he he um, he talks about that very high daydream where the soul starts spinning out music and so yeah. forth. So it kind of reminds me like in meditation, maybe a half a dozen times in my entire life, when this wonderful thing came to me and I was in